Next on Intimate Portrait, hosted by Meredith Vieira. She was the good girl who sang I Honestly Love You. And then she skyrocketed to fame as John Travolta's Good Girl Gone Bad in Greece. Olivia Newton-John's classic songs and movie roles have made her a pop culture icon worldwide. But it hasn't all been love songs and happy endings. She's also seen her career fall flat and fought a tough battle with breast cancer. How did this gal from down under get back on top? Well, here's Olivia's inspiring story. From sweet girl next door to sexy pop star, she's one of the world's most beloved performers. She was by far the best female singer then. I think that she'll forever be America's and the world's number one sweetheart. She's defined two generations with her magical voice and her active concern for the world. She's a down-to-earth, beautiful, wonderful person. If Olivia never performed again, she'd still be Olivia. And she has turned her devastating ordeal with breast cancer into a positive reaffirmation of life. She went through it incredibly bravely. I'm Diane Cannon. Join me as we celebrate a woman who's not only a close friend of mine, but a personal inspiration as well. She's a brilliant songstress, a caring individual, and most of all, a survivor. Olivia Newton-John, an intimate portrait, coming up next. Full of achievements, both global and personal, Olivia Newton-John is down to earth in every sense. Her genuine concern for the world and her amazing gift of song have inspired millions and made her known the world over. If you'd met me when I was a teenager, my vision was that I'd get married and have children, have a white picket fence and, and dogs and cats and horses. I wasn't like dreaming of being a big star. Maybe in the back of my mind I kind of felt if it was going to happen, it was going to happen, but it wasn't like priority. I wanted, you know, the perfect kind of life. And it's really weird that it didn't happen that way. Olivia Newton-John was born on September 26, 1948 in Cambridge, England to Bryn and Rena Newton-John. Her academic family included her father, a professor of German, and her grandfather, Max Born, the celebrated Nobel Prize winning physicist and friend of Albert Einstein. Olivia was a smart and happy child, but there was one thing that she wanted to change. I hated my name. Olivia Newton-John, can you imagine? Triple barrel name with an unusual name for a first name. I wanted to be like Claire Smith or Margaret Brown or, you know, anything but what I was. Now I'm really thrilled that I have an, a name that is different, but um, I think it's just a normal thing for a child to want to fit in and be like everybody else. As a child, there were three of us. Uh, my brother, then my sister, then me. My brother and sister were just a few years older, but enough that there was a, an age gap. She was so gorgeous and so sweet. I think you are, as a little child, what you are when you've grown up. I really do. When Olivia was five years old, her family moved to Australia, which would become her adopted home. It was during this time that Olivia fell in love with music. My father um, was Welsh, so I think that he had that hereditary beautiful voice. He had a beautiful singing voice. I think that's where I got my voice from, and my mother also sang and played an instrument. It was a very musical household. She was probably about seven or eight, and she used to just sing, and she had a natural ear, so she could harmonize naturally. In 1959, when Olivia was just 10 years old, her parents divorced. The traumatic event devastated her and sent her life into a whirlpool of change. I think it was very difficult for me at 10 going through a divorce. My dad went to live in Newcastle, my brother went to college, my sister went away, and it was just mum and me. I think that was a hard period. With her father and siblings gone, Olivia moved into a small apartment with her mother. To make ends meet, Irina Newton-John went to work at a time when most women stayed home to care for their children. I was a latchkey child. My mother had to get a job. She'd never worked before, and she had to start working, which was very brave of her. And being as young as I was, I really didn't understand what she was going through. But we got by, and she was very good to me in those early years, and I thank her for it, too. 
When Olivia was 13, her mother gave her an acoustic guitar. Still brokenhearted by the divorce of her parents, she began to channel her feelings into music. I started singing with three other girls. We had um, kind of the roll neck, um, black turtlenecks and hessian jackets and the, you know, the hair and this, and we'd go down to the jazz clubs and sing. And my mother put an end to that because she thought it was taking too much of my time. With the help of her boyfriend, Ian Turpey, Olivia began to master the guitar and delighted in singing the folk songs of the time. My sister was married to a man who had a coffee lounge and I would go in there and hang with her sometimes and uh, somebody came in and saw me sing and suggested that I went into this talent contest that was going on. So I went into that and I did the song Everything's Coming Up Roses and I won it, which was even more surprising and the prize was a trip to England. After her victory in the talent contest, Olivia was offered a job as hostess on a local children's TV show. I was offered a permanent job at the station. So then that was the big decision. Did I go back and finish my last year at school or did I take this job? And so I went to see one of my favorite teachers and asked him what he thought. And he said, well, I can just say that if you're going to be thinking about singing and trying to finish this last year of school, which is the hardest year, you're not going to make it. So I recommend that you follow your heart and what you want to do. And um, I followed his advice and I left school. My mother was not happy. And uh, there was even things in the paper in those days saying school or start and which should she do. Working on local TV for a year, 15-year-old Olivia was becoming increasingly well-known. Appearing regularly on The Go Show, Olivia became a minor celebrity in Melbourne. The Go Show was um, a teenage rock and roll show and it was kind of based on the American Bandstand and they'd have uh, maybe eight guests a week and we'd all come on and sing a couple of songs each. This was the most incredible looking girl, still is. She made your heart beat. I suspect that every young guy, anyone around my age at that time, had a thing about Olivia Newton-John. One week she did um, the locomotion, but she was so scared in television in those days, she didn't move. So the producer asked me to take her aside and teach her to dance a little bit, because I was an ex-dancer, so. And we became friends that way. In 1965, the prize trip that Olivia had won was about to expire, and at the urging of her mother, they left Australia for England. I didn't want to go. I really didn't want to go. I was like, I'm Australian, and I want to stay in Australia, and I have a boyfriend, and I was really didn't want to go, but she really insisted, and she was right, I'm sure. Now I have a 12-year-old, I really understand my mum better, but at the time I didn't, so thank you, Mum. While living in London with her mother, Olivia began singing in small clubs and even recorded her first single, Till You Say You'll Be Mine. But she was homesick for Australia and grew increasingly restless. I hated London, thought it was old and ugly, and now I think it's gorgeous, it's antique, you know, but at the time, you know, it's amazing in different times in your life how you see things before you've had any experience of life. And it was cold and grey and I was used to the blue skies of Australia. In the summer of 1966, Olivia got some great news. Her good friend Pat Carroll had won a trip to England where she planned to sing in a few clubs. It wasn't long before a new partnership was born. She stayed with Mum and I in the flat for a couple of weeks and then we actually got a flat together with two other girls. So I was only 17, 18. And I used to go to the clubs to work and Olivia would come and keep me company. And she wasn't working at the time. And uh, I was lonely and I didn't really want to go on trains and go all around England by myself. So I went to my agent and said, all the jobs I've got lined up, do you mind if I bring another girl in? And they said, not at all, because they'd, they'd seen her and knew she was pretty. And So we worked out all these harmonies and started doing all these shows together. And I split my wages with her for the first maybe four months. Calling themselves Pat and Olivia, the two girls traveled around England performing in small clubs and on American military bases. We stayed in these digs and they were very cheap and we did these clubs and two shows a night and sleazy clubs around the country. But we had a great time. It was really fun. It was exciting. It was all new to us, you know. In September of 1966, while performing with Pat at a music festival, Olivia met Bruce Welch of The Shadows. The two became very close and by 1967 had become romantically involved. Meanwhile, Pat and Olivia were growing in popularity. I think our break came when we started uh, being a support act for different people and through that we got a recording contract and we started doing big TV shows and so our careers took off there. We were invited back to Australia and given our own show. 
In those days, in order to become successful, you almost had to leave and come back. And you didn't have to do much, but you just had to leave and come back. So we came back with, you know, the press at the airport and our girls from London, and we had our own TV show. In 1968, Pat's visa expired. With her partner gone, Olivia was suddenly on her own, but not for long. Olivia's manager introduced her to music producer Don Kirshner, who handpicked her for his latest project. He was famous because he put the monkeys together, and the monkeys were a huge group at that time, and he was trying to do the same thing in a movie form. So he teamed up with Harry Saltzman, who made all the James Bond movies, and we were going to be the new movie monkeys. Like the Monkees, Tomorrow was a fabricated pop group whose playful misadventures were carefully designed to take the public by storm. Unlike the Monkees, it didn't work. We made this movie, <laughs> and it was going to be a series of movies, and this first movie was a space fantasy musical. Um, we were a group on Earth who was so great that we could solve the problems on this other planet. So they were going to beam us up and take us, or they did, they beamed us up to a spaceship and were going to take us to the planet to save their civilization. So need I say more? And when you look at it now, it's kind of camp. It's really funny. Look, sir, mister, our music won't be any good to you out there. We won't be able to cure anything. You just can't switch on feeling, heart or emotion. It comes through the people you play to. You turn on together. It was a great experience, and it flopped, and it was very disappointing. But um, and it, nevertheless, I gained a lot out of it. Coming up, Olivia goes solo and becomes an international sensation. Next, when Intimate Portrait continues. Lifetime. Television for women. I'm Diane Cannon. We now return to Olivia Newton-John and Intimate Portrait. Although tomorrow was a dismal failure, Olivia was not discouraged. By 1970, she had become engaged to Bruce Welch, who encouraged her to launch a career as a solo artist. Bruce had teamed up with John Farah, now married to Olivia's friend, Pat. Together, Welch and Farah would play an important role in shaping Olivia's musical style. I went to England in um, 1970 to join a group over there, and one of the members of the group was doing a television series at the time, so we couldn't work together as the group. And John had nothing to do, and neither did Bruce. And Peter Gormley, who was Olivia's manager in those days, said, well, why did you go in the studio and record a few tracks? So they came and lived in England with us, and John and Bruce actually became my producers of my first record that I made. Released in 1971, Olivia's first solo album included a cover of Bob Dylan's If Not For You, which became a minor hit. But her relationship with Bruce Welch had deteriorated, and the following year they split up. Although she continued recording with John Farah, it was Cliff Richard who helped Olivia make the leap from struggling artist to household name. Cliff Richard's manager, Peter Gormley, took me on. And Cliff was looking for somebody to sing a duet with. Peter, being my manager, had set up all my TV shows. And he said, do you think, you know, she should come on our show? And I said, yeah, of course, it'd be great. And of course, it was a chance to sing with her for the first time. Don't move away when you know I really want you. I have a wonderful history with him, and he really helped me with my career a lot, because he put me on his show. And I learned a lot from watching him, too. He's a wonderful performer. In 1973, Let Me Be There became Olivia's first top ten hit in America, though it made virtually no impact in England. Even more surprising, the song hit number one on the U.S. country charts, introducing Olivia's music to a whole new set of fans. Baby, I hang around here a little more than I should. We both know I got somewhere else to go. With its poignant lyrics and Olivia's moving interpretation, I Honestly Love You was an instant success, becoming her first number one hit and cementing her career in America at last. There's some people that are obviously very, very, you know, hell-bent on making a big success of their lives. With Olivia, it wasn't obvious at all. I mean, she went from one thing to another and it just progressed and segued into the next thing that, that was a big success. And the winner is, I can't read it, you have the glasses, <laughs> Oliver Newton-John. 
Right. The country-flavored sound of I Honestly Love You also caused a stir when Olivia was named Female Vocalist of the Year by the Country Music Association. At the moment, I'm touring Europe where there are millions of country fans. On behalf of all of them, I'd like to say a big hello to all of you in the heart of country music, especially tonight. Thank you all very much. Outraged that the award was given to an Australian pop singer, many CMA members quit in protest. Apparently, there was like a split in the, in the CMA and some people formed a new kind of section of it because they didn't like the idea that this little upstart of an Aussie could come in and, <laughs> and take their award. Unfazed by the uproar, Olivia plunged headfirst into country music. By performing at rodeos and county fairs and recording her first American album in Nashville, she was eventually accepted by country purists. I think they realized that maybe it was in their favor because I was opening up country to people that never listened to it before because people who are listening to pop weren't necessarily listening to country and mine was kind of pop country which is pretty much where a lot of country is now so um it's probably in the long run quite a good thing Have you never been Have you ever when olivia's next single have you never been mellow topped both the pop and country charts in 1975 the debate was over Olivia refused to be categorized, and her music was universal. We don't fit neatly into those little boxes. When you are like Olivia or myself, and you sing a lot of different styles of music, uh, it's impossible to categorize you, really. At the 1975 Grammy Awards, I Honestly Love You was chosen as 1974's Record of the Year, and Olivia was honored as the best female pop performer. With opportunity beckoning in the States, Olivia left England and relocated to Los Angeles. My love life wasn't going too well. My career wasn't going too well in England. I had a hit in America, and it was like, it wasn't too easy to make the decision to move. And the first place I visited was New York. That was pretty shocking. And I went to a department store, and some lady says, what do you want? And I remember like, oh, I was like weeping, leaving the shop because I, I couldn't believe it. I thought she was upset with me that I'd done something wrong, but it was just, you know, that was New York. <laughs> I just wasn't used to it. By the end of 1976, all of America knew Olivia's name. But the following year, her career would take a major turn that would transform her into an international superstar. I frequently had dinner parties for eight she was invited to one of them, uh, to which I'd also invited Alan Carr, who was casting for Greece. I had never met her in person. I'd never seen her perform. Well, by the time dessert came, I offered the part. I mean, she was so delightful at dinner. She was everything that the part was. She was funny, and she was smart, and she was coquettish. She just fit the role. I was worried if I could pull it off, because after making that movie tomorrow, I was really scared about making a mistake, because my musical career was going really well, and I didn't want to botch it up by making a movie that I wasn't good in. So I actually said, um, you know, I'd be interested in, in doing this movie, but I want to do a screen test. I want to do the screen test, and I really want to see if I think I can do it. The screen test convinced Olivia that she could make the film, and in the summer of 1977, she began filming. Guess mine is not the first heartbroken. My eyes are not the first to cry. Olivia was the big, huge pop star. And oh, I had seen her in her specials. And in fact, we were all kind of, you know, in awe. She was the big star on the set. Olivia immediately formed a close bond with her co-star, John Travolta. John and I were um, very close. And there was an obvious attraction between us during the filming of the movie. But we were both seeing other people. And I think that's probably what kept the chemistry alive on screen, because there was there was definitely something there. Well, the chemistry for us on the, on the film was, was very alive, you know? We were very, you could feel that we really cared for each other and that we were very attracted to each other. They'd be holding hands and they'd be giggling and laughing and, you know, there were a lot of gossip columnists around and uh, speculating what was going on because they really did have crushes on each other. There was kind of this flirtatious thing going on, but it never, it never really became anything. But I'm extremely fond of him. I think he's a wonderful, wonderful person. Released in June of 1978, Grease was an immediate phenomenon, and critics lauded Olivia's Hollywood debut. She was 
like born to play that part. She was so natural, some of the critics at the beginning didn't think that she was acting. The film's defining moment was Olivia's remarkable transformation from virgin to vamp during the film's finale. You couldn't imagine her making this transition. And then when she did, especially on the day that she did it, and she was all decked out in this black, we, we had the same reaction that we had on film. Film premieres all over the world. Olivia and John were mobbed by thousands of screaming fans. Boy, when Greece opened, it was it was a phenomenon. I mean, it was unbelievable. We pulled up in a convertible, John and I, and it was a mob scene. It was very exciting, very thrilling. And we went to London, and it was like a stampede. They were climbing all over the car. It was actually quite scary, the London premiere. We were. Uh almost crushed, the, the limousine, the, 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 the ceilings were caving in and the cars were being rocked back and forth and we didn't think we were going to make it to the theater and it was like a, a mob scene that was not to be believed. It was almost like England's answer to what the Beatles were to us at that moment. Greece would go on to become the highest grossing film musical of all time. 20 years after its release, the film remains a touchstone of 1970s culture and the most important turning point in Olivia's career. There was just incredible excitement about the film and it was a huge success both box office and the album, probably, probably the biggest thing that ever happened in my career as, as far as everything at once. I mean it was movie and film and every medium. I had no idea it would be like that. I thought it was a fun movie and it was really good and it would do well but I had no idea that it would be. You know, 20 years later, we just celebrated the 20th anniversary, and it's like happened all over again. Coming up, as her career takes off into the stratosphere, Olivia settles down to raise a family. Next, when Intimate Portrait continues. This program is sponsored by Revlon. I'm Diane Cannon. We now return to Olivia Newton John and Intimate Portrait. Grease made Olivia an international celebrity, and like her character in the film, she decided to reinvent her image. On her 1978 album, Totally Hot, Olivia abandoned her pure and innocent pop sound in favor of tougher, more rock-oriented material. I think in my career what helped me make a change in music was Grease, because um, as Sandy won, I had Hopesy devoted to you, as Sandy too, I got to sing You're the One That I Want, and I think that transition into that more kind of rock pop style gave me an opportunity to, you really go in more in that direction. It became a little more edgy after that. With a successful film to her credit, Olivia began looking for a follow-up project to Greece. In the musical fantasy Xanadu, Olivia was cast as a heavenly muse sent down to earth to aid a struggling artist. Two great things came out of uh, Santa Do. I met my future husband on the set and I got to work with Gene Kelly. I mean, how many people in their lifetime get to dance with John Travolta and Gene Kelly? I mean, I'm a very lucky person. During rehearsals for Santa Do, Olivia became enamored by a 20-year-old actor and dancer named Matt Latanzi. I met Matt on the set of Santa Do. He was the stand-in for the leading man. We didn't have a leading man yet. So Matt was my dance partner. By the time Xanadu opened in 1980, Olivia and Matt had become a couple. But unfortunately, the film failed to duplicate the success of Grease and was dismissed by critics and ignored by the public. There were some beautiful songs in Xanadu, but the picture being kind of a fantasy and reality, and it just didn't click with the audiences. Though the film Xanadu flopped, its unusually eclectic soundtrack became a huge success. Combining elements of rock, pop, disco, and swing, the album went platinum and gave Olivia her fourth number one hit, Magic. We have to believe we are magic. Nothing can stand in our way. We have to believe we are magic. Don't let your head ever stray. After Xanadu, it seemed to many that Olivia would never be able to the success of Greece. 
but her next project would become her greatest musical achievement and shattered her sweet girl next door image once and for all. With its hard rock beat and suggestive lyrics, Physical became Olivia's fifth number one hit, selling over a million copies worldwide and topping the U.S. charts for an incredible two and a half months. The accompanying music video helped launch America's fitness craze and became the unofficial anthem of the 1980s. Knew it was a hit song, but like two weeks before it was due to come out, I, I was panicked. It was like I suddenly realized that this was this was bold. This was even bolder than Greece. You know, this was like this, the lyrics. My goodness, how was I going to get away with this thing? And I said, we need to soften it somehow. We need to do a video that's about exercise and it's kind of funny and made a video that kind of went against what the lyrics were saying. But kind of went with them, but went against it too. So I think that kind of um, made it easier to take. But I was banned. I was banned. I'm very proud of it. Banned in Utah for a while. <laughs> Sporting a new haircut and athletic wardrobe, Olivia energetically performed sold-out concerts across America. Her show had an edge now. It had this whole other, almost moved into the Madonna-esque dimension where she got to be um, sexual. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. She blew us all away because there she's singing and she's dancing. She's doing aerobics. And it was just beyond anybody's expectation. She's a dynamic performer. You know, she was always captivating and, and entertaining. And, um, you know, it was a good show. At the age of 33, Olivia had become one of the most popular performers in the world. Olivia is the only female artist up to today that could have come out of Australia and been successful internationally. She was by far the best female singer then. And to me, she's by far at least one of the top five finest singers in the world. I think probably the most distinguishing thing about Olivia as a singer is her versatility. She can sing so many different styles of material. And she always sounds like she's enjoying it. I remember once driving from the airport in Vegas to Vegas in the days when she was like hugely big and she was staring at the Riviera and her name was up in these enormous lights and she looked up and she, she said, who is that person? I mean, she never really, and I still don't think she believes the magnitude of, of her stardom. While on the physical tour, Olivia came up with an idea that would once again team her up with her friend Pat Farah. When I was touring around America, I, I was really craving these Australian candies called Violet Crumble and, and Cherry Ripe and I wanted a meat pie and a milkshake and that's something you can only get in Australia and I was having this craving and I came back and I said to Pat, you know what, I really, I think it'd be great if we opened a little milk bar, which is like a 7-Eleven, where we could get all those Australian things. She said, why don't you and I open a store, an Australian store or something and sell all the imports because the ice is in town, there's nowhere to get Vegemite and Violet Crumbles and and I thought to myself, that's not bad. And I went home that night and I stayed up all night. And she called me the next day and she said, I've come up with an idea. We're going to open an all-Australian shop. We'll have a milk bar on one side, but we'll have all-Australian clothing and everything else on the other side. We asked everyone who, what, what they thought of when they thought of Australia, and the majority of people said koalas. And I was driving in a taxi with her in Sydney one day and I went, blue. She said, blue what? And I said, koala blue. That's it. It's got to be koala blue. And she said, yeah. In October of 1983, Koala Blue opened on Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles to great fanfare. With its original line of clothing and unique Australian merchandise, the store was an immediate success for Olivia and Pat. By the end of the year, Olivia began to focus on another partnership. Having been with Matt for over four years, she finally decided to settle down. She was very scared of the idea of marriage because she'd seen particularly mine just disintegrate around the place, you know. She'd seen me go through two of them and our parents' divorce and just about everybody she knew. And she didn't want to go there and she didn't want to go through what she'd seen everybody go through. So I guess she was just, you know, being careful. In December of 1984, Olivia and Matt finally tied the knot. Just three months later, Olivia became pregnant. On January 17, 1986, she gave birth to their daughter, Chloe Rose. When Chloe was born, um, I decided that, 
you know, I really wanted to be around and be a mum and be there for her. So I took quite a lot of time off. They were precious years, really fantastic, just to be able to spend them with her and be there. And it was wonderful. She's a wonderful, bright, funny, intelligent, um, sensitive little girl. And she's a joy, the best, the best thing that ever happened in my life. Though she put her career on hold, Olivia was still living an active life. By 1989, the Koala Blue Chain had expanded to 27 stores worldwide and was earning $14 million in sales. In 1990, because of her selfless commitment to environmental causes, the United Nations Environmental Program appointed her its first Goodwill Ambassador. And Chloe was growing into a smart and lively four-year-old who enjoyed playing with her best friend, Colette Chuda. We got pregnant within four weeks of each other. And when they were born, it was almost as if they knew each other. It was almost as if our friendship had brought them closely together from before they were born. And um, they remained that way until the tragedy. In 1990, Colette was diagnosed with Wilms tumor, a rare form of non-genetic cancer. On April 21st, 1991, at the age of five, Colette died. The tragic loss was painful to both Olivia and to Chloe. The person who had to face this the worst was Chloe. She knew that Colette was ill, but she did, never understood really, I don't think, the seriousness of it. As adults, we, we, know, we learn how to deal with our grief, but when you're a child, you know, and you're raised with this very special person in your life, as Chloe had been raised with Colette, I think that wound's a very deep one, and it continues in her heart. In Colette's memory, the Chudas formed the Children's Health and Environmental Coalition to help discover the environmental causes of childhood diseases. Because of her love for both the Chudas and the Earth, Olivia volunteered to become the organization's national spokesperson. As a little girl, we used to worry about things running out. What if we run out of trees or we run out of water? So I think in the back of my mind, there was always that awareness a, a little bit. But I think it really kicked in when I had Chloe and when I suddenly realized that this little bundle was my responsibility and that her future in some way was my responsibility, that she deserved to have clean air and clean water and food, or at least as good as I'd had it in my lifetime, that I took for granted. Coming up, in the course of a single year, Olivia is struck by a series of unforeseeable tragedies. Next, when Intimate Portrait continues. I'm Diane Cannon. We now return to Olivia Newton-John, an intimate portrait. In 1992, Olivia released Back to the Basics, a greatest hits compilation designed to rejuvenate her career and launch her first tour in a decade. But a series of personal tragedies would halt her comeback and change her life forever. Hit hard by the recent recession, Olivia and Pat were forced to close the Koala Blue stores and filed for bankruptcy. But even faced with the chain's collapse, the two remained the best of friends. We had a very powerful lawyer in Los Angeles called us into his office and said, would we like to get separate lawyers? And we said, no, why? And he said, because very often when partners get into litigation, it ends up that the partners end up fighting. And we said, that is not going to happen, and there's absolutely no reason why we'd need separate lawyers, because we're friends and we're in this together. And that's exactly what happened. We've been with each other through so many different stages in our lives. You know, we're friends and... We just like each other. Soon after Koala Blues collapse, Olivia learned that her father was dying of liver cancer. But before leaving for Australia to visit him, she discovered a lump in her breast. A needle biopsy indicated that it was nothing, but both Olivia and her doctor had their doubts. He wasn't sure it was nothing, and I wasn't feeling quite right, and I wasn't actually sure it was nothing either. So I went to see my father. My father was really ill. I said, Dad, I have to go back to America. I'm doing this tour, but as soon as I'm done, I'm going to come back and see you. While away with Matt for the 4th of July, Olivia got some devastating news. Her father had passed away. Brokenhearted, she returned to Los Angeles, where just days later, her doctor confirmed her worst fear. The lump was malignant. Olivia had breast cancer. It taught me a lot. I had to learn about putting myself first, which I wasn't very good at at that time. It was all about taking care of everybody else and pleasing everybody else. So that was kind of my first lesson. I couldn't even grieve my father's death because I had to take care of myself. Olivia announced her illness to the world on July 14th, and her tour was immediately canceled. Her treatment included a simple mastectomy 
and chemotherapy. It's amazing where you find your strength from. There's a self-preservation that kicks in, I think. And just wanting to be here for my daughter, you know, that was probably the number one reason where I found my strength from is that I had to set a good example. I think initially she must have been just so frightened. Frightened for herself, frightened for her family, and most of all frightened for Chloe because of what Chloe had experienced with Colette. The cancer to Chloe was death and she just watched this little girl slowly dying of cancer and she'd seen her and lost her. To think your mother has something like that, I think would be devastating to a child. I got through a whole year without mentioning it to Chloe. And, you know, on the, on the days when I had chemotherapy, she'd go to friends' houses to play and she'd be kept busy and I, would, I wouldn't be feeling well, but I, I was able to disguise it pretty well. Went back to Australia, went to my farm. She went to the local school. First day back at school, one of the kids at school told her, because it had been in the local paper, oh, your mum has cancer, you know. She came running home from school. Mummy, mummy, one of my friends said that you have cancer. That's not true, is it? And of course, at this point, I was totally finished with my treatment. I was taking some time off to recover, so I sat her down. I said, well, actually, yes, it is true, but I'm fine. Look, I'm healthy. and I'm, I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want to freak you out because you know you lost Colette and I wanted you to see that yes you can survive cancer it's not necessarily a death sentence and here I am but you know that was it was the right decision at the time but it was very hard to explain to her why I hadn't she said to me why don't you tell me I could have taken care of you it was very a very touching moment and um, she was mad at me and I'm sure it caused a little distrust with her with me because I, I had kept that from her, but um, I know it was the right thing at the time. Because the lump was detected early, Olivia received a clean bill of health after her treatment, and she remains free of cancer to this day. She's got a lot of power, and she's got a lot of will, and um, she's a winner. She went through it incredibly bravely and made a decision straight away that she was going to beat it, and she has. I'm very lucky. I made it. I'm si it's six years now, and um, it's taught me a lot about myself and it's taught me a lot about uh, life and how lucky I am and that I'm here and to appreciate every day. It's a hard way to learn it and um, I don't wish that experience on anybody but I think in some ways it was a gift to me to learn. Coming up, Olivia's recovery gives her a second chance at life and in music. Next, when Intimate Portrait continues. I'm Diane Cannon. We now return to Olivia Newton-John, an intimate portrait. Olivia's recovery from breast cancer inspired her to write several intensely spiritual and highly personal songs. Recorded in a small studio in the Australian country, Gaia, One Woman's Journey, was an ethereal celebration of life and of the environment. I woke up in the middle of the night with a song in my head, which was the song Gaia, about um, about the planet and how she's crying out to us and saying, um, respect me, I need you to protect me, for it is you, not me, whose fate's in jeopardy. Because we talk about the planet as dying, but the truth is, is the planet will go on, but we'll be gone because she always regenerates and comes back. So that was my kind of vision. And after that, I kept waking up in the night with different songs in my head until I'd written an album. Gaia proved to be an important step in Olivia's healing, and she began returning to work. But in 1995, after over a decade of marriage, Olivia and Matt decided to divorce. Aware of the painful feelings she felt when her own parents split up, Olivia vowed to remain friends with Matt for the sake of their daughter. Her father and I got divorced at around the same time as my parents were divorced, which is something that I never wanted to happen for her. I mean, when I got married, that was not gonna be, that was not the plan. So I'm sorry for that for her but I know that out of it she'll become an even more, and I know she has a more compassionate person and an understanding one. And now, ladies and gentlemen, your host for the evening, Olivia Newton-John. Despite the stresses in her private life, Olivia still took the time to work on behalf of her favorite causes. In 1996, four years after her ordeal with cancer, Olivia hosted lifetime applauds the fight against breast cancer and prove to the world that it is possible to be a survivor. I feel very lucky to be a survivor of this year's four years and going strong. 
some people would say, why don't you put it behind you and why do you continue to talk about it? Well, A, I can't because I'm a public figure and no matter what happens in your life, it's always going to be brought to your attention because people are, are interested or curious and they, they, want, they want to know. So I had to come to terms with the fact that it's always going to be there. And now I think that's a good thing because it's kind of affirming life every time I talk about it. It's like, yes, I had breast cancer six years ago and I'm still here. And in affirming that, I may be helping somebody out there who is going through it now. Today, Olivia splits her time between her Malibu home and her farm in Australia. Chloe remains the center of her life, and it is for her benefit that Olivia continues to devote time to issues of the environment and breast cancer awareness. For me, it's finding out what, what is it, what is going on this plant that one in eight women is getting breast cancer, and not only women in 40s and 50s, but women in their 20s. I mean, there has to be something wrong. You know, one of the other reasons I get involved in environmental concerns and in breast cancer concerns is I want to be able to say it to her that no, you're not going to get it and we're going to clean up this environment and this planet and, you know, you won't be faced with these things. Here we are at last. Although she had sung occasionally, Olivia had not recorded regularly in years, but she suddenly realized how important music really was to her. I really had no plans to sing again, for a while anyway, and I got to thinking about how I took my voice for granted and how I wasn't singing, but I always presumed my voice was there. If I opened my mouth in the shower, it was there if I sang in the car. But what if? What if something happened? And what if they had to operate? And what if I lost my voice? And I made a decision. I said, you have a gift, you're a singer, you're not singing. Released in 1998, Back With a Heart, was Olivia's first major album in nearly a decade. Recorded in Nashville, it was her long-awaited return to her pop country roots. I'm 50. It's um, a new phase of life. It's exciting. I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy I made it. And um, it's kind of exciting. I'm enjoying being older and, and feeling more comfortable with life and with, with myself. And I'd say that the title track on my new album, which is Back With A Heart, is kind of how I feel. I'm back with a heart. I'm intact, I'm ready to move on. And the mellower times, I guess, are coming, aren't they? So I'm getting into that side of it. If we both were born in another place and time, this moment might be ending in a kiss. Whether she is on the stage or out of the limelight, Olivia Newton-John will continue to celebrate her second chance in music, in family, and in life. I try to live in the moment as much as I can and enjoy life as it comes up. And I just want to be healthy and happy and have my daughter be healthy and happy and um, be fulfilled in what I do. And there's so many things I want to learn and do that life is just this huge adventure out there. And I want to go get some. Olivia's records continue to sell, and she continues to appear in films and on TV. She also continues to speak publicly on environmental and health issues. And most importantly, she remains healthy and happy. For Lifetime's Intimate Portrait, I'm Meredith Vieira.